please note that the opinions expressed in this conversation are those of the panelists and do not necessarily represent the views of the University of British Columbia. I want to welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming on this miserable day, but um, I That's think you're in course. for a huge treat. We are so fortunate to have such an eminent panel before us to, um, to host us on this next of the leadership series that we've been doing for a number of years now. Um, the idea of these sessions is to simply get to know leaders in our midst, to understand what drives them, to understand what they think is important, um, just to get to know them a bit better so that we can also uh, be inspired and be better leaders ourselves. Um, the format for today is uh, my co-host here is, sorry, I didn't mention myself, I'm Susan Porter, I'm the Dean and Vice Provost. Our no Dean! <laughs> the president of the GSS. And I should say our audience here is eminent as well because all of you are have been leaders amongst yourselves. You've been either um, major scholarship holders or um, 3MT finalists or people involved in uh, leadership yourself in graduate student organizations. And we have a couple of postdocs, I think. Do we have a couple, any postdocs? I think. Yeah, please. <laughs> Welcome. Literally a couple. Um, <laughs> just for, out of interest, perhaps for the panel as well, maybe I could get a, just a show of hands. Who here is involved in the social sciences humanities end of things? Okay. Uh, the natural sciences. Okay. The health, that maybe that includes health sciences. The engineering, the applied sciences. Uh, what am I missing? Other applied sciences. <laughs> Miss. Creative. Creative. <laughs> okay, I think we've come. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so welcome, you folks, as well. So the, the format today will be, we'll just introduce the panel, and then Chris and I will alternate um, asking questions of them, and then it's your turn. So we'll do that until 4.20, and I think that's the plan. Mm -hmm. And then we'll, after your questions, we'll end here at about uh, 5, and then there'll be a dinner for all those who'd like to stay after, and you're most, all are most welcome to that. So I think we can sit. We'll try without a microphone. Can people hear us okay? Yeah, okay. Let us, just let us know if you can't. So I'm just going to, before I even introduce the uh, speakers, I thought I'd just take a little bit more of a time to talk about why we have this series. When we developed the Graduate Pathways to Success um, program a few years ago, we tried to figure out what we could say was the purpose of graduate education and postdoctoral education. And what we came up with is a very succinct phrase, which is the formation of scholars who make a difference for good in the world. And it's very consistent with the place and promise, um, positive, and so on. So in our leaders' dialogue, we've been calling it uh, Leader Dialogue series, we've been calling it On Making a Difference for Good, because we believe everyone here today has made a significant difference for good in the world. So, um, as I've said, the idea is to get to know them and to get to know their passions, their motivations, and what drives them. So, um, with that, maybe we'll just start the introductions very briefly. I hope you've, you probably know about most of these people already or have read about them, so I'll be very brief. Chris and I are going to alternate again the introductions. So, um, Professor Stephen Toop, I'm sure you all know. He is the 12th president of UBC. He has a distinguished career as an international law scholar um, and among many related activities, which I can't uh, all talk about, and associations, he's represented... Western Europe and North America on the UN Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances, and was a member of the UN Observer Delegation to the post-apartheid South African elections. Just, coming, just before coming here, he was president of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. Um, his education was a bachelor's from Harvard in history and literature, two law degrees from McGill, a PhD from Cambridge, and he also served as a law clerk to the then Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Brian Dixon. He was a faculty member at McGill and served as the youngest dean, I'm sure you've heard that all the time, at, uh, I won't say what age, but That's anyway, very young. Um, he's had numerous publications, including a most recently, I don't know how you did it, but a 2010 book 
uh, Legitimacy and Legality in International Law and International Account, which actually won an award, American Society of International Law's 2011 Certificate of Merit for Creative Scholarship. And unfortunately, he will be leaving us uh, shortly in July, so we nabbed him when we could. The honor next of introducing Dr. Uh, Arvind Gupta. Uh, he is a professor of computer science at UBC. Uh, and he also serves the very important role. Some of you have been affected by, or a lot of you have been affected by his work as CEO and scientific director of MyTax. He obtained his Bachelor of Science from McMaster uh, and then his PhD from U of T. He held afterwards a NSERC postdoctoral fellowship at University of Waterloo. Uh, before joining the faculty of the School of Computer Science at SFU in 1991. Since then, uh, he's become a professor at UBC and done all of his fantastic things with MyTax. His research focuses on algorithmic combinatorials with applications to bioinformatics, something that <laughs> goes well, well over my head. Uh, he's published over 80 peer-reviewed papers and supervised more than 35 graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. Uh, currently, he supervises two PhD students and one postdoctoral fellow, so he is uh, familiar with all of our problems and concerns. Uh, Arvind is known best for his leadership in MyTax, recognized nationally and internationally for creating novel experiences, uh, sorry, novel uh, experimental learning opportunities for graduate students, including research and development projects with non-academic organizations and international research exchanges. In 2010, Arvind sat on the Jenkins panel, who Report Innovation Canada, a call to action significantly impacted federal innovation policy. In 2012, he was appointed to the Government of Canada's Science, Technology, and Innovation Council, the government's main external policy advisory body on issues relating to science and technology. This body produces a regular national report that measures Canada's science and technology performance against international standards of excellence. As well as with my, as my tax, Arvind was involved in the founding of the Pacific Institute for Mathematical Sciences, which encompasses seven Western Canadian universities and the University of Washington, as well as the BAMP International Research Station in Mathematical Innovation and Discovery. A regular speaker on research, innovation, and advanced skills, Arvind shares his, sorry, his opinions nationally and internationally on the role of post-secondary institutions in enhancing Canadian productivity. He's made more than 100 appearances across Canada, with many more abroad, including Mexico, the UK, Germany, Australia, India, Brazil, China, and the US. He's a regular contributor to the National Dialogue on Innovation, Talent Development, and Industrial Research and Development through editorials, interviews, panels, and plenary talks. Welcome. My pleasure to introduce Peter Klein, who is a uh, distinguished journalist and director of the Graduate School of Journalism. Um, he's had a varied career in journalism, uh, been a producer for the CBS new show 60 Minutes, Eyewitness, documentary series for CBS, and a History Channel US series. Um, and his work has been featured on many media outlets, including PBS Frontline, ABC News, Al Jazeera, New York Times, and many others. Um, he's won numerous Emmy Awards uh, in 2010 for his own UBC classes documentary on international electronic waste. In 2000, a 60 Minutes investigation into the former Soviet Union's smallpox weapons program. And he shared one in 1996 for a documentary about global health. His education is a BA from, uh, his formal education, a <laughs> BA in philosophy from Penn State University and a Masters from Columbia. And he's taught at Columbia and New York University. He joined UBC in 2005, and one of the things which um, he's done since now, and perhaps we can touch on it, is he launched the International Reporting Program, which is a fascinating uh, program in which he takes students overseas uh, to produce major works of investigative journalism. So welcome. Peter. And finally, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Louise Naismith, who I must say, when I was rereading over your bio last night, has an incredibly large amount of uh, titles. Dr. Naismith attained her medical degree from McGill, uh, and then her CCFP in uh, the early 80s from there. As a faculty member in the Department of Medicine at McGill, um, her scholarship focused on medical education, spanning the continuum uh, from undergraduate through continuing professional development. 
Uh, she was in 1995 named chair of the Department of Faculty, uh, sorry, Department of, Fam Department of Family Medicine at McGill, a position that she held until 2002 when she moved to Toronto to take on the same role, the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. She completed a Master's of Education from McGill in 1994 and has published and presented nationally and internationally. She has been involved in a number of projects that focus on integration of care for chronic illness and interdisciplinary care, including promoting self-care. As well, she's a member of the National Expert Committee on Interprofessional Education for Collaborative Patient-Centered Practices and of the Health Education Task Force. Uh, both Health Canada initiatives. From 2000, sorry, from 1990, sorry, from 2005 to 2006, she was the president of the College of Family of Health Disciplines at the University of British Columbia. For the last decade, she has been working with educators, practitioners, health authorities, and the government to advance collaborative practices and interprofessional education in various jurisdictions within Canada. So, welcome very much. <laughs> We're excited to have you all. So to start off, we'll, get, we'll give you an easy question. Uh, <laughs> maybe all four of you could answer this one. So um, thinking about leadership in general, and some of, you know, it's a vast literature and it's constantly shifting. And I think one conclusion is there's no one leadership style that works all the time. But there has been a shift, particularly post uh, the disasters in the United States, Enron and the 2008 collapse where there's been a shift of thinking about leadership from the sort of the charismatic, all-powerful man to um, <laughs> what has been turned more positive uh, leadership models or attributes. And one of these is just consistent with many of them that are being bandied about these days. It's called authentic leadership. And I believe you all are authentic leaders. And part of authentic leadership is, you know, the, the, the gist of it is, is the importance of being of a leader being authentic to themselves, being self-aware, having a strong moral compass, and doing the things that they feel passionate about, that, that it is truly their um, selves that, are, that they are following. Um, although they do place the interests of the institution and society above them, but it is their passion that drives them. Um, part of authentic leaders is, is having integrity, um, as well as admitting, it, which includes admitting mistakes um, and learning from them, acknowledging your shortcomings, and relational transparency, being able to um, to be open about oneself and about one's one's goals. Um, so, in that in that sentiment, um, we would like to know the authentic you, um, <laughs> not just what you've accomplished, which we've heard a lot about, or what you think. But for now, let me just ask: What drives you? What is your passion? What is that good that we talk about at the end of the road? What is that good that you seek um, in your roles in leadership and in life? Is that an easy question? <laughs> Should we, can, are you okay to start? Or? <laughs> I was hoping Stephen would start. <laughs> uh, gosh, you know, it, it, it is a, that's a tough question, um, but I think fundamentally, I have a feeling that what drives most of us in one way or another is to have an impact on the world. I mean, we are fundamentally animals, right? And um, non-human animals have an impact on the world simply by passing on their genes. Um, I think we have, we've sort of interpolated that, obviously a lot of humans pass on their genes and have children, but we've, we've interpolated that in, in, in other ways as well. And that doesn't necessarily mean to be, you know, Shakespeare or to be uh, Einstein. Um, we, we all have impacts on the world in, in, in our own ways. And um, for me, and as a journalist, um, the more and more as, I, as I've sort of matured as a journalist, that's really become kind of what's driven me. Um, not just, here's this great, great work of journalism that might reflect on me. I've cared much, much less about that, but rather, you know, I put it out there and, and what impact has it had? And that's, that's often not necessarily, you know, it's, it's made a policy change or it's gotten bad people arrested. I mean, those are the obvious impacts. Um, the more interesting and I think the more important impacts are long-term impacts. Even if it's you're simply part of a conversation that may be a years-long or decades-long conversation that might have a very, very um, important but, but slow change in the world. Um, 
And as a journalist, I think that's, that's really important. I think for scholars, that's what drives scholars, right? I mean, you, the impact you have as a, as a scholar is, is your publication record and citations. And that's, you know, we often, on, on a very simple level at the university, look at those numbers in a very crass way of how many citations we had. But there's a reason for that, right? There's a reason because that means your work is having an impact. So. Thanks. Next. Yep. <laughs> Next in line. Um, and these are difficult questions because I think at the and certainly having been asked to do this, I've thought long and hard about why am I even in any, I mean, why did I even accept to do any of these positions? And I think we were talking earlier, I was talking with you, Susan, would I have ever thought that I would be an academic leader in the sense of the way I am now when I was in my 20s or even 30s? And the answer is not in a million years, right? Um, did I actively seek out to do any of this? I actually didn't. But I think what happened is that opportunities presented themselves to me. And because I cared, and I thought maybe I actually could make a difference, I decided to pursue them. Um, which means that part of being authentic is to, to be able to see those opportunities and to be able to really question yourself. Do you care enough? that you're willing to do this. And you care enough not for yourself, but you care enough for the issue, for the people, for what it is they're really asking you to do. And I think when you said that, yes, you have to be true to yourself, and you do need to be true to yourself, but you need to understand the big why. And that has to be clear to you. Because if it's not clear to you, then I would say be careful about pursuing certain things. I think the other, what really has been the joy of my leadership um, um, opportunities in my leadership uh, uh, years has been investing in other people. They, um, and I think a lot of the authentic, what we're talking about leadership now, is the ability to see in others potential and to be able to help nurture them and watch them grow and give them enough opportunities, don't micromanage them, but you still have to keep an eye on what's happening and to watch when you plant a seed it actually takes root and it can flourish. My greatest joys have been to see individuals whom I've just given an opportunity to do certain things, and they have really become leaders in and of themselves. That, I think if you can do that, which means you build relationships, you build trust, and you really invest in that. I think there are some leaders that keep everything to themselves. I personally don't think that that's the most effective style of leadership. I, I like uh, a lot of the discourse around authentic leadership because I think most leadership discussion, frankly, is useless. Uh, I, I mean, there is a lot of literature. I think most of it is not very helpful. I think it's unbelievably superficial and trying to carve out one path and say this is the right way for all leaders to be is not possible. So I'll, I'll try and be authentic and speak a bit about myself. Um, I think that what motivates me is a different uh, understanding of leadership, which has existed for thousands of years now, and it's servant leadership. Uh, and it's an idea that you have both an opportunity and at some level an obligation to try to make the world a better place. And that because you have that obligation, you have to find ways in which whatever your gifts are, and we all have diverse gifts, we try to deploy them in the most effective manner possible so that we can actually help make the world a better place. And I think, I, just to pick up on your point, that's about working with people. It's absolutely not about being the charismatic leader, in my view. I, I've, most people who are seen to have been charismatic leaders historically, most of them, with minor exceptions, are pretty awful people. Uh, Steve Jobs. Here's a good example of someone who's a truly dreadful person, in my view, uh, but a charismatic leader and a visionary in his own way, but not someone that I would emulate. Um, Adolf Hitler was a charismatic leader, but obviously not something uh, that you'd want to emulate. Bill Clinton is an interesting character because he did have that charismatic leadership ability, but he also, I think, lacked discipline. So another thing I would say about leadership that's authentic and can actually drive something is it has to be quite disciplined because you only have so many gifts and you ha only have so many opportunities that you can actually deploy to try to make the world a better place. 
So last thing I think I'd say on it is, it's really about, for me, building teams of people working together. And so that picks up on, on your point as well, Peter, that this is longitudinal. It doesn't all happen over very brief moments in time. I often think that what I'm doing in my role today is setting up things that will happen 20 years from now if we're fortunate. And, and working with people who will then continue on generation to generation, building on what predecessors have done. And it's never the case that any single person, especially in large institutions, can build him or herself. It's all about working with others, and it's all about understanding that this is generational and not my own particular contribution. Well, thank you. And, and I want to first of all thank all of you for coming to listen to us today. This is really a privilege and, and um, wonderful answers over here. Um, I, I think of myself as a professor, first and foremost, and, and I have to say that my passion is really being a professor, working with my graduate students, doing my research, and that's a very privileged position to be in. It's very few people in this world who are given the resources of society to pursue their own defined passions. And, and you know, it's hard to imagine many others, maybe in the priesthood, um, but, but who else gets to decide for themselves what they think is important. And, and, and when you have that privilege, it's really important to think how you use that for the maximal public good. Because it is the public that's supporting the institution, that's supporting me. And, and for me, when I see the young people I work with, when I see my graduate students, I realize they're the future of the country, of the world. If we're going to make this a better place, I can impact a certain set of um, things around me, but my students, the people that I work with every day and the people that I mentor can have a huge and disproportionate uh, impact on the world. And, and so how I got into leadership was thinking about my graduate students and the kinds of experiences we're creating for them. How are we thinking about first and foremost what's best for them? Because unfortunately in academia, it's really easy to get sucked into this idea that the system exists for me, <laughs> right? It's about how many papers I write. And you know what, it's great to have lots of PhD students to write papers with, because I can up my counts really fast by taking another PhD student and get more grant money and, and look really good to the rest of the world. So for me, leadership is first of all reflecting back, what can I give as opposed to what do I receive? And, and in the position we have in universities, it's about what do we give to our students? Because our students will then give to society. And, and, and I think that one of the things we haven't thought enough about in, in the system is what kinds of experiences we impart on our students. And, and you know, recently I gave a talk in Calgary and I was asked to think about what has created the best, the greatest innovators in this world. And I started looking the people that I thought have been the greatest innovators, and of course, the first person we all think was Einstein. You know, what is it that formed Einstein? What formed Einstein's thinking was being a patent clerk. It wasn't that he was, because he was a patent clerk, he thought of the special theory of relativity. I'll argue that because, it's not because he had the time as a patent clerk, it's because of the experiences he has as a patent clerk. And being in a situation where people are thinking about timepieces, and can you have absolute time in different locations, that he thought about this. So, I'd say that for me, being a leader is, is making sure we create an environment for others to succeed, maybe sometimes nudging them into places they're a little uncomfortable, mm -hmm. um, and, but making sure it's a safe environment for them to go out and do new things. And it's really for us as academics, it's about our students and making sure our students have the opportunities to succeed well beyond what maybe we ourselves have, but to go and then for them to do good in the world. So I'd, I'd like to ask a question which is a, kind of a, a bit of a continuation of, of Susan's. And the idea is, is to help everyone around the room uh, just get to know you guys a little bit better as, as we are just meeting. And so I think it's, it's fairly uh, safe to say that you all are very well accomplished people and you probably have a lot of uh, familiarity with, with success and you've, you've, tried, you've had it in many different forms. So I'd like to ask you guys, and this, this might be something similar, it might be some, sort of simple, or it might be something uh, you know, very personal to you, but what to you is, is success? What do you define as being successful? So I'll start with, with you. 
I guess that's fair enough. I wish I'd now gotten that question first. <laughs> um, but success is defined in lots of different ways. There's personal successes. And did you get to do the things you want to do? There's also success measured in did the people that you work with every day, were they, did they achieve their objectives? Because for me, um, you know, I work with a wonderfully talented group of people at my tax and, and who are totally dedicated. Um, I'm actually amazed how dedicated they are to achieving the objectives of the organization. And for me, success is really ensuring that they have the tools to achieve their own objectives. Um, and then, of course, that ripples down because they will feel success if the people they're working with achieve their objectives. So I measure my success in, in whether or not I've been able to create the conditions for the people that I impact on a day-to-day -day basis um, going out and achieving their objectives and feeling good about what they've been able to do uh, every single day. And, and, and I think it's, you know, success happens short-term and long-term. So, you know, we're often told, well, always think about the long-term. You know, what did you get, you know, where do you want to be in five years? What do you want to achieve? But the short-term successes are really important that make sure that, that every day, every week, every month, you feel good about what you've got accomplished because then you will wake up the next day even more energized to go out and do wonderful things. I, I think um, I've always been, well, since I started formal education, uh, certainly at the level of, of the university, the way I think about success is very much in, in the terms that Aristotle framed it in terms of thinking about the good life. Uh, I, I don't think you can differentiate uh, success in one field and feel that you've been successful if all other parts of your life are falling apart around you or if you are creating success in one sphere by damaging relationships in other spheres. And it's, that's really tough. And so the notion of the good life to me is very helpful because it, it, acts, it asks you to think about all of your relationships, both personal and, and professional and societal, cultural, and, and to try to ask yourself whether or not in the things that you choose to do, you're actually incrementally making those relationships better. And, and that's similar to what Arvind said. I think that if you wake up each day and ask yourself, can I make decisions today that actually make some little piece of my world better and, and the world of those people around me a little bit better, I think that's success. And I think it often is incremental. Over time, it can be dramatic. But each day waking up and asking yourself that question uh, probably is important because if you don't constantly ask yourself that question, I think you start to fall really deeply out of balance because you're always being pulled it, to try to accomplish something very, very precise in specific fields. And I think it's that notion of the good life, the whole life, that helps to generate a sense of success in the longer term. It's difficult to really add. Um, maybe I can expand because the, what you both have said is very, would be very much how I would define success. I think success, the reflection on what success means is I think what both of you have said and the importance of trying to define for you what that means. The word success probably is the wrong word to use, frankly, because it implies um, most of us think, well, we have achieved something and it often can be too tangible. I think that for, for me, that, that well, uh, a, good, a very close colleague of mine and I give a workshop every year for the award winners in, um, in our family medicine world, students and residents. And one of the exercises we get them to do later on in the workshop is to set their own goals, three year, maybe five year, not beyond, professional but also personal goals, mm -hmm. which speaks to what you're saying. I think too often people who are driven um, get caught in this, this crazy notion of I've got to succeed, I've got to succeed, and they, they get caught and they forget about the other part of their life. And at the end of the day, they have less than probably what they started with. And so I think that you do need, maybe the first message here is success needs to be defined 
in that total sphere. You as a person, the individuals whom you interact with, not just at work, but in your personal life, your friends, your family. If you forget that, you will not be a happy person. I think that one other answer I could give to that, because I have, as you've heard, I've been a leader in various places, and leaving a job is often a time when you think, gee, did, did I do anything? No. <laughs> what happened here? And the way I phrased it is that, can I leave and everything will carry forward and keep moving in the, in the direction that I set? And I've been very fortunate to be able to say yes when I left McGill and yes when I left Toronto. I did not feel that things were going to be precariously perched, would fall apart, because I was gone. And in looking back, those two departments are moving ahead, not only because of me, but in part because of my leadership. So that's another way of really looking, I think, for me personally, some of my work successes. And then I won't talk about my children at this point. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I. I, I don't like, really like the question, so I'm not going to answer it. Um, <laughs> it's your prerogative. You prerogative. Right. <laughs> but but I'll, I'll reflect on why I don't like the question. And it's not, it's not really that I don't like the question, but it's a, it's, a, it's a troublesome question because the answer is so different for so many different people at different stages of their life. You know, if you think about what's, what's success for a baby, you know, suckling. What's success for a teenager? <laughs> being cool. What's success for, uh, you know, a, a, an undergrad? maybe getting into a good graduate program. Um, it changes so much throughout your life, right? What success uh, when you graduate, getting a good job, or, or finding a partner, or having children, or buying a house, or whatever. You know, I mean, we all have such different definitions of success. Um, and to me, that's, you know, go, going back to my kind of role as a journalist, that's a sign of a flawed question because, you know, like a, like a lawyer, you kind of want to know the answer and you want to have kind of a predictable answer to a question. This doesn't have a predictable answer. Uh, but in, in, on the other hand, it's a great question because it really is so open-ended that we can all kind of define it in a different way. For me, it comes back to, not to sound kind of like I'm cheating on my own answer from the last one, but it's impact, right? I mean, I think it, if you look at the trajectory of how the definitions, the general definitions of success change from, you know, infanthood to, to old age, um, it, it, as you mature in life, you care much less about your own stuff. You care much less about, you know, feeding yourself or being cool, as you might, you know, in the early years of your life. And you care much more about making an impact in the world, doing something, whether it's, you know, raising your kids well and sending them off to the world, or or empowering your colleagues or your students to to do good work, um, to leave a legacy, to make a change. Um, at your institution, whether it's a university or a company or whatever it may be. Um, so for me, you know, the, the direction we're going in as, as we mature is success is impact, having, it, having some tangible change in the world for good. Uh, so I guess that's sort of my, I guess I, I lied, I did answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> I would Thank say that that's so. one of the reasons, the very reason we ask it is to, is to deconstruct it, right. to, to mm -hmm. splatter it out and let us think about it. So that's good. Um, so here's another easy question. Um, <laughs> you've all accomplished great things. What have you, where have you fallen? Where, where have you made mistakes? What have you, I wouldn't say regret, because I, I, whenever I make mistakes, I, I often think of Pierre Trudeau's comment that when he's makes, makes them, when he's made a mistake, he says, no regrets, but I don't make the same mistake twice. And I, I try to follow that, but I don't always really succeed. But where have you made mistakes? What would you have done differently if you had, if you could do it over? Stephen? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> I... I you know, if I were a politician, I'd have to have an answer to this question, or I, I would be unelectable, uh, because this because you know you have to be able to say, oh no, I'm a deeply flawed human, and and, and I've made all of these terrible mistakes. Um, you know, did you inhale that kind of question? Uh, I. I have been unbelievably fortunate in my life, uh, I have to say. Uh, and I'm just one of those really weird people who from an early age actually knew what I wanted to do. And not that I wanted to be, for example, a university president. That never occurred to me, even, <laughs> when, I was, even when I was being interviewed for the job. It hadn't really occurred to me. Uh, so it wasn't that kind of, of trajectory. But the trajectory of, of 
wanting to work in international, on international issues, turned out to be an international lawyer, I thought I might be a diplomat. That all sort of happened, and, and I, I never got off uh, the path. So in, in a really personal sense, I didn't make a mistake that, that I had to correct for so that I could get to where I might like to be and where I find life rewarding and encouraging. Have I made mistakes? Of course. I mean, I'm sure I've made thousands of mistakes over time. I would say the biggest mistake, uh, and it's something I've been thinking about recently, and it goes to my previous answer, is that you know, coming here, my children were in their early teens or just around uh, the tween period, and now they're all leaving home. And so if I, if I said that I'd made a mistake, it would have been that I didn't get as n enough of the balance that I talked about earlier. Uh, that, you know, the last eight years, uh, there have been a lot of times when I've not been around and where I have absolutely missed things. Um, so, you know, it's not crisis. Luckily, they're great kids and, you know, I have a wonderful spouse who's been incredibly supportive to me and to them. And so I think they, are actually in a great place, but as they go, I certainly have a, a sense that I've missed out on, on elements of, of what it would have meant to be more with them. So that's probably my biggest regret. Hmm. Any of the others? Yeah. Well, um, again, the, the mistake can be your own career choice, and I think, like Stephen, I've been so fortunate to have opportunities that I would not regret any of them at all. Um, when it comes to mistakes you make, as a, as a physician, one has to deal with making sometimes some pretty horrible mistakes, right? And so I would agree. One thing you said, or somebody said, is the importance of being able to acknowledge and not beating up on yourself after you've made a mistake. Sometimes the mistakes are not that important, and other times they are, no matter how important or not. Um, I know I'm not quite answering the question, but, but I think it's worth stressing is that if you continue to ruminate on it and to bring yourself down as a result of it, and I have to work with young physicians sometimes who do make mistakes and get them really to work through it, to come to grips with it, to accept it, and to learn from it. <clears throat> Um, so that they can turn something that is often a very negative experience into something that's as positive as you can possibly make it. But I think the, mis the, the mistake word often results, or if you make errors and mistakes, often it results in some, your own personality trait, something that you have inside of you. And, and I recognized over time that, again, probably because I am a physician, I like to get things done, right? I mean, let's get on with it and let's just do things. And the mistakes I've made throughout my career have been going too quickly. And I've had to recognize that and I've had to pull back. And I've really had to pull back and I've had to learn how to be way more patient because as you said earlier, some things take time. And if you rush them, they won't happen. So the lesson I learned was to one, to be able to recognize that in spite of my wanting to get things done, I needed to just slow down and so I learned by basically doing that and not going into sort of super slow mode, but at the same time using that balance and doing enough reflection about myself. So I think that it's not about the mistake, it's about why you might have made the error and being able to reflect on that so that you do learn for the future. You don't, you don't all have to answer, <laughs> but if you have I'll just say very quickly, and, and, and I agree with um, both of them, um, that in some sense, you are the sum total of your experiences. So to say that I made a mistake would say that I want to be a different person than who I am today, and, and that's just not true. I, I'm very happy who I am. But as I reflect back, what I, what I think I realize is that there are so many opportunities that come your way. That as you grow, there are so many opportunities. And when you're young, you often don't see them. That you know, I was really set on being a university professor um, from the time I was in my mid-twenties. I just couldn't imagine that, that someone paid me to do the kinds of things I love doing. It was just <laughs> fascinating for me. And, and if I think back to it, I think I could have taken more advantage of opportunities that the world presented to me. I, I could have um, 
not, I, I think I was a little arrogant about the fact that I was always really doing well in school, that, you know, I, and when I went to grad school, I, you know, things were working out so well for me, and I think if I, if I think back, I could have stepped away from that a little bit more, um, and, and just taken advantage of, of a broader world. Um, we are so lucky in Canada to have these kinds of opportunities presented to us, and not everyone gets them, so I, I wouldn't call it a regret as much as a life lesson that, that you know, do some things just for the sake of doing them. You don't have to have be driven to write yet one more paper as a graduate student because that's the one that you think is going to get you a job as a faculty member. You'll get the job anyway as a faculty member if, if you really um, set on doing great work as opposed to trying to get through all the little hurdles that are presented along the way and just, and just experience life. Because that's the wonderful thing about being a human being is that we can make those choices to go and have new experiences. I'll just give a very short answer as well. I mean, it's, uh, I, I played jazz piano. It's not kind of my other life. And one of, the, one of the things that I learned early on in, in playing jazz piano is there are no mistakes, you know? Some of the most interesting things that I've ever heard a pianist, jazz pianist do stem from a mistake. You, they hit a wrong note, and then they use that to go into a new direction. And I, I, I've always... I've always found that to be such a such a interesting lesson for life. It, you know, you listen to to, to people's stories and successful people's stories. Um, there's almost always <coughs> terrible tragedies in their backgrounds and terrible mistakes that they've made, and it's they didn't let it get them down, like you were saying. Rather, they learned from it. They turned it on its head and used that to propel themselves to learn a lesson. Um, and I think that that's. You know, that's the key. We've all, I mean, obviously, I'm sure everyone in this room, certainly all of us, have made mistakes, things we regret. The question is, that's not the, that's not the issue. We're all, we're all human. That's part of being human. Um, the question is, what do you do next? And that's, that's where the real mistakes are, what you do after you make the mistake, how you deal with it, um, and how you learn from it. And if you use it to grow, great. If you don't, that's the real mistake. Can I just comment a little bit on that? One is that we've talked about um, authentic leaders making mistakes but then learning from them. But I actually was reading yesterday about, actually um, it was a, a paper by our associate Dean Larry Walker, who is a moral psychologist. He interviewed 50 um, moral exemplars who were either brave or caring. And one of the commonalities that he found, them that, found amongst them was that in their life narrative, they, their negative experiences were, were seen as redemptive not contaminating. Mm -hmm. So they, they learned from and they grew from their negative experiences, and that's something I think is important. So I, I think that's hugely important. Um, and Peter has got it at, at a division, in my view, which is really important. We talk about mistake. But the notion of mistake is something we didn't intend, right? It, it happens. We may have made a bad choice, but we didn't intend the negative consequences. And so I think that's largely what we've been talking about. But the notion that bad things happen to you, even if you certainly don't intend them and you would never want them to, uh, also has a shaping influence. And you know, we're human beings, and unfortunately, typically, bad things will happen to us over the course of a lifetime. And I, I think that that notion of treating bad things not as unbelievable burdens that you have to carry, but as, as things that somehow you have to find a means of transcending uh, is really important. My parents were uh, murdered uh, when I was uh, dean of uh, law at McGill, which was a horrible, horrible, uh, obviously, life experience. And I, I remember thinking at that moment, uh, it was a very conscious decision, actually, that I would not think of myself as a victim. That's partly why I have all sorts of problems with the way the government today treats criminal law issues, but we'll leave that one aside. <laughs> but you can, you can say to yourself, I've experienced horrors, or I know people who have experienced horrors, and you can, and you can try, it's not easy psychologically, but you can try, to say this is something that can be redemptive. And I, I think that's also really important in terms of resilience for people through life as, as a way forward to potential leadership. So this, this is a question, uh, kind of taking it in a different uh, 
angle, I suppose, or, or looking at something different that I always like to ask. And it doesn't matter if it's within your current uh, major leadership role you have right now, or it was the first job you have, you know, in elementary school or high school. I, I'd like to know uh, what do you feel is your, uh, or what is the, the accomplishment you are most proud of and why? Peter. <laughs> um, payback. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I missed that question on the on the crib sheet. Um, I, gosh. Uh, you know, it, it's easy to say. Uh, you know, as a journalist, it's this work of journalism or that work of journalism, or this job as a journalist or that job as a journalist. Um, I, I, I will, I'll focus it for, I mean, first and foremost, I really think of myself as, as, a, as a journalist, so I'll sort of try to answer it from that perspective. Um, you know, and, and I'm going to sort of have two answers, and they're going to completely contradict each other. Um, one of my, one of my kind of measures of success when I do a work of journalism, particularly if it's a work of investigative journalism, is that I've kind of pissed off everybody equally. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's sort of a good sign of balance, right? That you, um, all sides are mad at you, but not that mad at you. And, you know, no one's going to kill you at, at the end. Um, and, and I think that, you know, when I've, um, when I've done that well, I, I feel like I've done a, a good job as a journalist. Um, on the other hand, I think it's, it's um, very important, again, just going back as a journalist, I know this won't necessarily be all that applicable to most people, except maybe one in here are journalists, but um, maybe you can extrapolate something from it, is that uh, as a journalist, and you know, certainly a social scientist, and many of you in here in medicine, you, know, you deal with humans on a regular basis, right? And you have an impact on their lives, and you're taking something from them, right? You're taking their story, you're taking whatever it is. Um, and I just... You know, if you run into that person a year later or five years later or ten years later and they have a good kind of memory of ex an experience with you, gosh, that's like, that's the most great, that's the greatest thing ever. I was just in New York um, and I threw a little party for our old friends because I moved from New York a few years ago and I had invited a guy who was a, a subject of a story 17 years ago and here I am still friends with him and um, still very close with him. And that's, to me, a, a huge measure of, of accomplishment that, uh, you know, and it was a very, it was a story about Dr. Sister's suicide. It's a very, very close, kind of intense experience. And um, if, a, if a story source um, doesn't feel burned, and especially if you've done something that's, you know, intense like this, or maybe even negative potentially about them, and they feel like, you know, I'm, maybe I was mad at you right after the story, but when I look back on it, you got it right, and maybe it even had a, a, a positive impact um, on, on their life. That, to me, is the greatest thing you could do as a journalist. I mean, I'll take a stab. This is a bit like the success question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But the specifics. <laughs> well, except that I can't answer. There's no one accomplishment. I, I mean, I can't. I, um, you could ch I could choose something, but I... I I think that that would be an un, I wouldn't be truthful. I would be pretty dishonest in trying to choose something. But I think it's very much along the lines of what you described, Peter. To me, the greatest accomplishments, and it can be on a daily basis or it could be on a longer term basis, is being able to see a person, and in my case, it could be one of my children, it could be one of my patients. It could be one of my residents, it could be one of the, my co-workers, etc., who um, would be able to, maybe a year later, be able to look at me and say thank you. Because what our relationship, the kind of time you gave me, actually made a difference in my life. If I can, the odd time I will get somebody who will come to me, I'll just run into them and they'll say that, and I feel, wow. That's what really matters here. So to me, accomplishments, I would measure accomplishment, maybe that's how I could answer this, in terms of how many individuals have actually, I, I have been able to make a difference. Sometimes unknowingly and sometimes very consciously. Um, 
the only way I can answer it maybe is by uh, referring to where I think that I've been able to make a difference. And, and, and that's sort of across a whole range of different activities, volunteer activities, uh, employment. And, and I think one of the things that I like to be able to do is to draw people together towards consensus. And I've done that a lot as chair of various organizations. I've just stepped down as chair of the Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada. It's been a two-year battle <laughs> of trying to bring you know, 90 universities across the country together with another organization, the U15, which is a subset of the major research universities, and trying just to, to, to have them work together and not be pulling apart. And, and luckily, I've had a number of places in my life where I've been able to feel that I've been able to do that. And for me, that's felt like an accomplishment. Can I just bug you a bit, a little bit about how you do that? <laughs> Can you tell us how you do it? <laughs> well, I, you know, the, fir the first and most important thing is listening, um, is that you have to actually hear what people feel and believe. Uh, because if you, if you don't listen really carefully, there's no way of finding the points where you can draw them together. Uh, and then I think the second thing you have to do is try to identify where to, to, to synthesize various perspectives to try to identify that point where coalescence might be possible. So I think it's those two things, really. And then you test it. You have to throw it out and test it and not propose it as the answer, but test it and then see whether indeed you've captured the, the truth of, of where that coalescence might be, and then you might have to adjust. But I think that's the process. So, so when I first heard the question, uh, my mind went to these grandiose things. Like <laughs> I'm very proud that, that we've been able to convince the government a little bit more that our graduate students are the key to making Canada a better place, these kinds of things. But as I sat here and I listened to everyone else, you know, what really do I get personal pride from? And, and then I thought about a young woman I met this morning um, who, uh, she came from Iran uh, to UBC. She did her PhD in power engineering. And I just met her, ser serendipity, um, and she said, you don't know me, but, you know, my tax made a huge difference to my life. And, and she said, you know, I came here, I did my PhD, I had these great offers in Silicon Valley, I got involved with MyTax, and now I work for BC Hydro, and my job is to think about how to bring power to native communities that don't have regular power. Mm -hmm. And she started crying. And she said, you know, I never thought in my life I would do this. My, my, I was really set to go to Silicon Valley and make a lot of money <laughs> and make my parents proud of me. But I get this different, I mean, she was clearly just moved by the fact that she brought someone power every day that didn't have power before. And I never met her before. I had no idea she'd done this project with us and that she'd gotten onto this career. But you know, I thought that's really impacting individuals is what can really make you proud of yourself because, because I've changed someone's life without really knowing that my actions were changing that person's life. Whereas I get these gross statistics presented to me that this many students got these kinds of jobs and, and so on. And, and you, know, you kind of feel proud that you've seen these changes in numbers. And I'm a numbers guy, so I understand that, yes, these are meaningful numbers. But for me, it's individual stories and, and individual people that you get to see and you understand that, that their lives have become different and in ways that they want to, to make, to do well. And, and even sometimes they, realize that they themselves had never thought about going in this direction. She would never thought that, that impacting a, a First Nations community was more important to her than making the big bucks in Silicon Valley. But getting that experience of working, um, she went to Smithers, which I have to admit, I'm, I'm from Ontario, so I'm not quite sure where Smithers is. But, um, but she talked about how, how it really opened her eyes to how some people live in Canada. And she was saying that, you know, she's not sure people in Iran live like these people live in Smithers. Um, but they had three hours of power a day, and now they have 24 hours. And, and I had to say that was very transitive for me. She was so proud of this accomplishment that I was proud that I could have some tiny role in her success. It's my turn, is it? <laughs> so both Chris and I, thanks, all of you, that's great.
both Chris and I have some questions um, that probably are more relevant for some of you than others. And maybe I'll start off with one for Peter. Um, it's not a hard one, I don't think. <laughs> you keep saying that. <laughs> At a recent uh, um, Canadian Association for Graduate Studies um, conference, one of the key speakers was Paul Wells, who's a McLean journalist. And his point was that with the massive reduction in journalists um, in the last few decades and in the, the lack of in-depth analysis that often happens because of that, his advice to academics and to graduate students, ultimately, was to take a more direct role in public dissemination and mm -hmm. to provide, and I think these were his words, a sophisticated and subtle message about the importance of scholarship, not only what they're doing, but the importance of scholarship and the importance of universities um, in that realm. So I guess my question for you is two questions. Should, being an educator, my question is, should all graduate students and postdocs know how to engage and communicate with the public? And secondly, you know, for example, an op-ed, should they all know how to do an op-ed page before they graduate? Should we make sure they know how to do that before they graduate? And secondly, um, in the same way that we expect them to be uh, to have a peer to be able to write a peer reviewed article, so I guess those are the. I'm sorry, my my earlier question was: is is that a valid? Uh, is the initial uh, statement valid in that the academics should be more directly involved in dissemination? And secondly, should we all know how to do it? So I I am a journalist, right? I'm just a regular journalist, um, uh, regular guy. <laughs> And I was very resistant when I first started getting involved in universities. And the reason was because I didn't know what the hell was going on around me. <laughs> you know, like you, you go to, to uh, you know, any, any department at any university and I just was constantly lost. I'd look at people's, you know, bio pages and they made no sense to me. i talked to, to, to scholars, I didn't know what they were talking about. And, they were using words that I didn't even know existed. Um, <laughs> and I was like, what is this weird place? You know, I mean, I went through university, but I mean, you know, I chose the courses I, I was interested in, and I learned the lingo, and I guess I kind of muddled my way through it. Uh, but now that I was sort of, all of a sudden, peers of these people who were super smart, and, and in this, but in a very specific area, uh, I found a really, really an alienating place. And, and I'm sure that, that and I know that many scholars feel that when they go to anywhere outside of their field. It's like, you know, a statistician goes to, you know, look at sociology and they're like, what are, they, what are these people talking about? Um, so I think the biggest mistake that we make at universities is this, is that, that very, very often there is a lack of knowledge translation outside of that very specific field. And, and it's, you know, we all understand why it happens because you're, you, you're rewarded for doing that. You're rewarded for advancing your very specific little area and and gaining the, the recognition of your specific peers in, the, in that, that area. Um, but I think that, as, a, as very rightly so, I mean, with journalism changing so dramatically and public engagement changing so dramatically, and so much incredible, I mean, what I've realized now, now that I am, you know, I'm, I'm a director, a head, director of a department and I'm constantly dealing with other heads of, in, in arts, I realized what an incredible amount of interesting work that goes on at the university. And when I do kind of put myself, try to, try to understand and really start talking to them and understand what they're doing and read the, read the work and try to have them explain what's going on, I was like, wow, this is incredible. Um, and I'm, I'm fortunate that I have a CIHR grant with pharmaceutical science and we're doing this big project about rare disease, working with all these different statisticians and, and physicians and, and, and pharmaceutical scientists and economists, um, you know, you, once you really delve in, you realize what high level work is, is being done. But that translation is so challenging. And it's, I don't think it's fair to say every graduate student needs to write a, learn how to write an op-ed, because that's a very specific skill. And frankly, I think that it, it, it diminishes the challenge of writing an op-ed. An op-ed is really hard to write. Most journalists can't write the op-eds. Um, and and even a good op-eds rarely get published. So, but what 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 I what I say to to, to um, scholars is, have your elevator pitch. If you run into someone, and they say, "What do you do?" Or you run into an old buddy from high school, and they say, "Hey, what are you doing?" If you start talking about you know quantum mechanics and, and, and you know <laughs> string theory, they're going to be lost. So for the most part, so 
find a way to explain to your old buddy from high school what you're doing now in the time it takes to write 10, 10 stories in an elevator. If you could do that, you are 90% there. Because frankly, if you could do that, you can write an op-ed. And you can write 100 op-eds. Because then you understand, you could put yourself in the mindset of people outside of your field. Um, and I think, I think we'd all benefit. Universities would benefit, scholars would benefit, and society would be benefit. Because I do feel like so often, the public is cut off from an incredible amount of work that goes on at universities because of this. May I add? You certainly may. Because I actually feel really very strongly about this. And um, you are all very smart. You are all becoming experts in a certain area, I'm assuming, right? That's why you're graduate students, et cetera. You do, I strongly believe that you have a responsibility to make sure that what you are working on is understood more broadly. It's not. And writing an article to be published in a scientific journal isn't enough. And I'm really going to, I mean, I'm being fairly strong in my language, and maybe this refers to the third pillar of UBC of community engagement. So few people can actually get up in front of a lay audience and describe what they do in a meaningful way that actually makes a difference to the people who are ultimately should be benefiting from your work. That's a skill that needs to be taught. I don't think you can do it without learning how to do it. And I think all of you as well need to, if the opportunity arises, know how to actually talk to politicians. Because your MP um, or beyond, um, and I think again, that's a skill that you need to invest in. Um, we used to teach some of our students how to actually give a lecture that wouldn't put people to sleep. Um, so I do, I think we, we probably are shortchanging and we need to, it's not about writing an op-ed. It's being able to get up and be able to speak. You will be asked sometimes to serve as someone's going to call you up and ask you, would you be willing to just do an interview? Do you have any idea how to do that? The perils and pitfalls of doing an interview, but also how to get your message across. So these, I think, are skills that we should be teaching. I don't want to belabor this point, because I know you have a lot of other questions, but there's one other thing that I, I, would, I do want to say. Um, uh, it'll be very brief. Uh, recently, uh, head of another department, an academic department had revealed to me, and it's, you know, and he's upset about this, that in his department, um, if a tenure track professor writes an op-ed, and I'll use op-ed because you've given that example, and that's, that's exactly what he said. A tenure track professor writes an op-ed, not only does he or she not get credit for that, for tenure, and we all know that, obviously, but you get docked, you get penalized, and in his department. And that's because, I won't tell you Stephen who it is, um, and that's because the, the, the supervisor uh, you know, feels like you are taking time away from, from doing peer-reviewed publication. And this is purely my opinion, and you can all obviously pursue your careers any way you want, but I think that we should all band together and fight that system. And stay to, you know, when you, all of you are tenure track, if, if your supervisor is saying, you know, why did you write that op-ed? You shouldn't have done that. You say, you know what? I did that at 2 o'clock in the morning, and it was in my own time. You know, if I decide to go skiing, don't take issue with it. This is my second time. And tell them to F off. Uh, can I just add on that? This is one of the, into our past. There you go. One of the interesting things, we just had this discussion at the executive of the university uh, three days ago because we're looking at the, uh, the whole area of community engagement, et cetera, and we're moving forward and trying to develop the strategy around that. And one of the things that strikes me so much is that this is actually such a differentiator across the university. In your discipline, in my discipline, in many disciplines, you are given enormous credit for getting out there and actually engaging with the public. And in fact, you're expected to figure out how to do translational work. That's part of what it is to be a very good professor of law, because you actually want to affect public policy. You want change to take place. Oddly, I think most professors, no matter what their field, most people who have academic careers do want to affect change. And we've got to drive hard against that kind of mentality, which is largely rooted, I'll be very frank, in the arts and sciences. That's where it largely is. And we have to address that. Because it's really undermining the ability 
of the university to actually play the role in society that we say we want to play. And to go back to the point Arvin made earlier, it, it means that we can't wake up and feel that we're making the world a better place. And that's crazy. Why would we put ourselves in that position? Well, <laughs> I, I'm not sure it's the op-ed that's as important as learning how to communicate. And so yeah. what I always ask my students is, is it more important to have an idea or to be able to communicate your idea to the rest of the world? Mm -hmm. The second is far more important. Because if you have an idea and you don't tell anyone about it, the idea dies. Right? You have to get your ideas out there. And, and I'm part of a discipline where it may, some may consider it a waste of time to go and engage the outside world. And, and that comes from an old style belief that we have a right to the public purse. We do not have a right to the public purse. We have the privilege of the public funding this institution, which means we have a duty to tell the public what we do with the funds they give us. You know, the way, I, okay, for me this is a very personal issue because my next door neighbor is a back cooperator. Now he's probably the smartest person I know. He dropped out of school in grade 11 because he had to support his family. And I have seen him do amazing things. I mean, just things that I think most PhDs would be flabbergasted by the mind, kinds of calculations he can do in his mind. He goes and digs ditches for $25 an hour to pay my salary. And he really believes what I do is important. He tells me, Arvin, I'm so happy that you go and do research to make Canada a better place. We have a duty to tell him what we do. Because if we don't, one day he could say, you know, why am I paying your salary? Why am I breaking my back? So you get to sit in a comfortable office at UBC and get to sit and just think for a living. We have a duty to society around us. I'm not saying each one of us is going to learn to write an op-ed. That is a very specialized skill and it takes time and practice and it's very frustrating. I've written a couple of op-eds, you know, I've gotten a lot of rejections. Um, but learning to communicate with the world around us is extremely important. To feel, because see, when you start explaining to someone what you do in language that they can understand, you learn a lot yourself mm -hmm. about what it is that you do. It's self-reflective. Why is what I'm doing important to the person at the Safeway checkout line? And why should they care about my work? And, and so I think I, you know, this idea of being able to give an elevator pitch, I think it's important for you to talk to your next door neighbor and explain why they should fund what you do. And when you get good at doing that, it'll actually change the kind of research you yourself start doing it where you position yourself in your careers. I'm glad that we have a few 3MT finalists here and you are very adept at that. So. <laughs> I'm just going to sure. see where Jackie is. Throw a pitch there. Is, three minute thesis. Is, uh, if anyone is interested in getting better at that, three minute thesis competition is coming up soon. It's a perfect opportunity to learn. So uh, I, I would actually like to ask another question that builds on uh, what Susan just asked, which builds on, uh, or which is looking into the nature of what a PhD is. And when you kind of look at, say, over to the UK, you'll see a very different PhD than what you'd see down in the States. And this is a, a conversation, at least the, the student societies have started having uh, across Canada over the last few years, and I, I believe it's been happening at the, the uh, faculty level. And I'm uh, curious as to what you guys think are things that should be changed uh, in graduate studies in Canada. Whoever wants to. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'm gonna. I gotta put myself right out on a limb. Uh, I think a lot of things have to change. Um, I actually chose to go to the UK to do my PhD uh, because I thought it was a better model for me. It's not the better model for everyone, and, and I should be very clear that I already had four years as an undergraduate and four years as a law student before I did my PhD. So I was into you know year eleven when I graduated. Uh, so I felt uh, when I wanted to do my PhD that the last thing I needed to do was sit through one more course. I was not willing to do it. I just said, I can't do that anymore. I can't listen to someone lecture at me uh, ever again. Uh, and I, that all goes into some of the transition that has to take place within universities around how, how we teach. But for me, I do think that the Canadian model is frankly, as so often the case, an uncomfortable amalgam of the British tradition, the French tradition, and the American tradition. 
Uh, and I don't think we've quite got it right. Uh, and this is a very personal view now. I am not expressing an opinion on behalf of the university, and I'm not driving uh, about what I'm about to say. But I really think that uh, the PhD is an opportunity to deeply explore areas uh, that allow you to uh, read widely and then try to do the kind of synthesis that I talked about before. I think uh, I would discourage a lot of teaching in the PhD program. I think some teaching experience is great if you want to go on, uh, especially to have an academic career. But for many people, it's not that relevant because most PhDs won't have academic careers. Uh, so I would discourage that as a funding model because I think it actually replicates hier hierarchies that are not fair or, or reasonable uh, for undergraduates as well. Uh, I would really encourage uh, support for PhDs through uh, research funding as opposed to teaching funding. I would try to ensure that a PhD takes no longer than three to four at most years, uh, especially if you've done a master's degree. I would encourage a lot of people not to do a master's degree if they really have a very clear sense of where they want to go. I don't think there should automatically be an assumption that you have to do a master's and then a PhD. It depends on the discipline to some extent. So I would look uh, quite deeply at the programs to really try and figure out what we're trying to achieve with the PhD. And I'll end by saying we have to be really careful as, as academics not to imagine that the PhD is a little sort of doll making process to replicate ourselves. And I think that's the history of a lot of PhD programs, that we're looking to get people into the programs who look like we did and then to produce them in a way that we were produced and we feel that we're doing the rigorous thing. Uh, we need to think much more about alternative career paths for PhDs and we have to help people along the way that many people have already talked about on the panel, to think about careers in a different way to help them develop the skill sets that are going to be needed in a wider world. So I agree with everything Stephen said. Let me just say that you know, someone who supervised a lot of PhD students, and, I, and I've had students say to me, well, I've done the things I think I need to do. Can I graduate today? And I say, well, you can graduate when you start your PhD. Um, there's a difference between an undergraduate degree and a PhD. At the undergraduate level, students should learn how to learn, how to synthesize information, pick up the pieces that are important, how to answer the questions that are posed to them. For me, I feel my PhD students are ready when they start asking really good questions. And that's not easy. And some students learn faster than others. Some students come in and within two, three years, they're asking all the right questions. And of course, they're always good at answering questions because that's what they've spent so much of their career learning. I think we've lost some of that thinking in the system. You know, this idea that we're really training young people to ask good questions. And if you know how to ask good questions, that'll transcend whether you become an academic or you go into government politics and work for a company. Whatever you do, you're asking good questions that are moving the ball down the court. You're asking the questions that'll fundamentally change things. So I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do, but it's something that, that students have, have to learn to be challenged to do. So you know, when one of my PhD students comes and says, I want to work on this thing, usually I, you know, when they're young, you say, well, why? You, you want to work on it because you think it'll get you a paper. You think it gets you a little token that'll get you a job down the road. It's not what's going to get you a job. What's going to get you a job is that you show some vision that, for the field. So, I guess I'm not a 100% believer in the time of length. I, I know a lot of people think, and Stephen said this, that we should get students out in four years. I do think, though, that students who aren't going to make it, we should get them off the track much sooner. Um, one, of the, one of the things that's happened in the Canadian system is we get a lot of credit for having PhD students. My grants are higher if I have PhD students. It encourages two behaviors. One, to keep the students around, right? In fact, in some ways, I'm encouraged to have students around who are not doing much. Because I get count for them, I'm probably not giving them much support. They can TA and do other things. And the second unfortunate thing, and, and I think this is something we should worry about, really good students are discouraged from graduating. Because they're the ones who are helping me produce papers. They're the ones who are making me look really like a shiny star. And I think those are things we need to think about. What is the reward system that we as professors are getting 
Because the reward really should be to produce great students who are going out and doing wonderful things. Right? It should be the outcome, not the process. And right now, unfortunately, we're a little bit rewarding the process and not the outcome. But having said all that, um, I do think, and I'm really impressed, how hard students work today. Absolutely. I have to say, the current, you know, what I've seen in the last 10 years is PhD students work much, they work much harder than I ever worked, I'll be honest. I mean, I had a great life as a PhD student, you know. <laughs> People were giving me money. I was going out with my friends. We were talking about issues. I was writing a few papers here and there. Um, I was pretty sure I was going to get an academic position. Um, so I know you guys have it really tough. Right? And, and I feel for you. And I know how much you will, more you will struggle, especially if you decide on an academic route uh, than we did. But that means there's a lot more onus on us to fairly represent what you're going to do, to set the R6, to be really clear what we expect from you, and, and to get you out there and, and accomplishing, <coughs> getting the skill sets you will need, um, and, and just being really clear about them. So I think that we do need some change, but I think fundamentally the model works. It's just that we as professors have a little bit been motivated to do slightly different things than what we should be doing. I know, I mean, I can't answer the question in terms of what has to change, but I'll just reflect on what I've seen. Um, one of the things you didn't mention is that, and as Stephen knows, I was vice president students pro tem for a seven month period while we were looking for a new vice president students, which opened my eyes to a lot of different aspects within the university that in medicine you tend to be kind of isolated from the real world of, of the university. Um, and also wearing my hat as a family physician working in a clinic here on campus where we actually see a, a fair number of PhD students. What has struck me in both those roles is the incredible stress that you and your colleagues are under. Um, I don't actually know how to fix that, but I think what I'm hearing, and I, and I think what we have heard is the expectations, the lack of clarity in terms of where this is going to lead me, so the career counseling that you would potentially need to know that you're not all going to be profs, um, those are some of the elements. Really working with supervisors, and I've heard some horrendous stories of the incredible. <laughs> From any of my um, students? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, and I. I but, no but really, uh, the way some of the PhD students are treated is actually appalling. So, so there is work we have to do with the level of the profs, and that's a, a culture. It's probably more prevalent in certain disciplines than in others. Um, and I don't think this is something we can ignore. The mental health stats from our graduate students is actually quite frightening. Anxiety and depression is higher among grad students than it is among the undergrads. And you could say, wait a minute, it shouldn't really be like that, but it actually is. So those are things that are telling us that, yeah, there are changes that are needed. Beyond that, I can't really comment what they are, but I think we have smart people who can help sort this out. I had an interesting conversation over the holidays with somebody in the UBC development office. So we can't understand why the graduate students contribute much less as alumni to the university than the <laughs> undergraduate students. <laughs> I was thinking, wow, it's really obvious why. <laughs> um, anyway, so you know, even for UBC, it might be smart from a development, you know, for long-term sustainability to make sure that our PhD students really identify this as an extremely positive, rewarding experience. Well, I would love to jump into this conversation myself. But I, I, I bet you would. <laughs> but, um, but it's actually time for you guys to start oh. asking questions. So the floor is open. Don't all speak at once. OK. Um, yeah. I have a, I'm a Chris Campbell. Um, I'm uh, interested in just a very short question. Number one, what bothers you um, I mean, thinking about your future in your individual fields? And number two, where do you derive um, you know, insight, inspiration from? Um, Dr. Gupta mentioned Einstein in the patent office thinking about time. <laughs> and uh, so he, had a, he, he was situated, didn't come out of nowhere. Um, I'm wondering where you derive your insight, inspiration, whether you work with people or things or information. <coughs> what bothers you? What, what bothers you and where you get your inspiration? I'll answer the bother if someone else answers the inspiration. <laughs> I, I guess what bothers me is, I, and maybe this is just because I now deal much more with government than I did throughout my career, but there's a real sense of short-termism and incrementalism in thinking. And what that's doing is driving governments to think about this notion of commercialization. 
in, front, in my mind at least, in, in complete the wrong way. You know, they, there's this sense in government that we all have this great idea sitting in our drawer, in our desk drawer, and if we just pulled it out, they could create a Google. And government policy seems to be driven by this thought that, um, that we're all just sitting on, on things that, that really sh we should be putting out there somehow in society. So I guess I'm often bothered by that kind of short-term thinking, that there's some short-term fix to societal problems, as opposed to getting the system right. And long-term, it will do better if you get, get the pieces right and, and let people flourish. So often I find myself trying to explain to policymakers about the pieces that should work. Having said that, I think the Canadian bureauc the bureaucracy in government is really very strong and very powerful. And we need to go back to a time when they're trusted much more by government to think for the system. So, I'm not, you know, sometimes with these kinds of questions, you kind of think the last conversation we had. <laughs> and this morning I met two ministers of the crown, so <laughs> it could be that that's why my mind is going there. But, but that always bothers me a little bit that sometimes our decision makers think very short term. Um, similar to that, the, what, and I'll be very specific, and I don't mean to be disrespectful of this province, but what has really bothered me since moving to British Columbia is the fact that the mountains, nothing happens anywhere else but in BC. And the ability, and, and this is primarily looking at some of our associations that I work with or government, that if you talk about what other models that exist, and so my particular passion is in primary care reform and in different models of care. You try and talk about these, the things that are going on in Ontario or Quebec, it's as if you really have just, you've been heretical. Um, and talk about bothering, but it also drives me to say, I'll be darned. I mean, maybe that's getting back to success. But at the end of the day, we can start to see some shift in thinking by our government folks. And I would agree, I think the the people at the ADM level and director level are quite open to it. It's uh, the short-term stuff that goes on higher. So that bothers me, but it also drives me to really think that before I leave, I hope that there will have been some change in that, in that area. But the parochialism can be really quite stifling. We're not really answering the inspiration. I'm, not, I'm going to go back to bother as well. But I mean, <laughs> my, my answer is the same as yours. And it sort of, it sounds like you, what bothers you is, is arrogance to some extent. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that, I, I think arrogance is one of the worst sins on, mm -hmm. on earth. I mean, serial killers are arrogant. They think they're better than the people they're killing. So arrogance is, is, is at the root of so many ills. And in my particular field, in terms of changing journalism landscape, um, immediate red flag when someone says they know the, they know the future of journalism. They know why it's going, why it's changing, and how it's going to change. That's BS. There's no way. I mean, there are so many. I mean, the Daily Show lives off of making fun of of arrogant people, right? <laughs> the arrogant journalists who predict, you know, the, the who's going to win the elections and all that. It. I just think that's. Uh, Humility is a sign of intelligence, in, in my mind. And um, whenever I encounter arrogant people in, in any field, I, I just get really bothered. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to try to draw out that on a, a one other bother piece, but then I will get to the inspiration piece, because I think that's important, too. I think that, for me, part of what connects all of those is a, a tendency that I see for people to simply reaffirm their own views by gathering information that is supportive of the view that they already hold. And I, I think you see that, frankly, in some of the transitions that have taken place in journalism, but you see it in transitions around how information is shared. I look at how people gather information now, and so much of it is by actually targeting places where you know you're going to like what you read. Not you. One knows what you like, what you're going to read, and 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 therefore this, I think, reaffirmation that we already have the answers is part of the intellectual incuriosity, which I would describe as absolutely pandemic in government right now, and I think it stems from arrogance because there's a sense of sort of confidence that I've already got the answer, and I just need to be reaffirmed in that view. That really bothers me, and for me, one way of of overcoming that, which I find incredibly helpful, is by reading uh, fiction. 
I read constantly uh, novels, short stories, uh, contemporary, older, and the reason I, I think it, I draw inspiration from it is because it goes back to the stories. It's, it's stories of people's lives that are totally different from my own and giving me some capacity, I hope, to develop a sense of humility around what it is that I do when you know people face unbelievable odds or people accomplish amazing things that you can only imagine and to see the talent to bring that to life really deeply inspires me and I hope generates a sense of empathy as well and that's where I'll conclude. I think the arrogance piece is always undercut if you can try to work on your sense of empathy. Um, okay, I think you were next. Uh, hi, thanks for the wonderful discussion. Uh, I'm Daria, and my question is related to um, time management. So <laughs> I'm wondering about um, what time do you get up? And, <laughs> <laughs> and also, do you procrastinate, and what do you do when you procrastinate? <laughs> okay, we'll go down the line. I, I, I get up at six. Between six and seven is like my magic hour. You know, we, in, in, in film we call it the magic hour because it's beautiful light. But it's also my magic hour because it is, my kids aren't up yet and I'm awake and, you know, I've had a first cup of coffee and I get, in, very often I get more done between six and seven than the rest of the day. And sometimes it's, you know, writing, and I do a lot of writing, so it's a good time where, you know, I know there's nothing else, to, I can't make a phone call, I can't, like, there's nothing else I could do. Um, sometimes it's just kind of going down my checklist to do, to do list, so that I'm starting my day after my kids wake up and they go to school and I get to, get to UBC, that I know that I've checked off 10, 15 things on my to-do list. Sometimes they're just, you know, personal things that I, you know, not even work-related, but it kind of clears my head. Um, and I go to sleep way too late, but uh, I, I blame my children for that. <laughs> um, I won't, sometimes I get up really early where most people will get an email from me and they'll say, uh, <laughs> did you ever go to bed? But that's my personal choice, um, but I do go to bed early, so I balance it, right? But I think the message here is from a time management, you need to know wh when are you best? You know, what is your peak hour? Um, I'm a morning person. I mean, I drive, I probably would drive some of you absolutely bonkers because I am a morning, I drive my kids nuts. Uh, but I am a morning person, that's my peak time. I can achieve a ton early in the morning, but by the time six o'clock rolls around, so I'm doing very well actually right now. <laughs> so, um, I, I can't, right? And so you do need to identify that because if you push yourself to work in the wrong times, it's, you're not gonna be very productive. And that means you'll be more efficient and you'll manage your time better. Um, what was the other question? <laughs> Sorry. Procrastination. procrastination. Ah. Um, I think you need to know you're procrastinating. You need to actually recognize it and label it. And there are a lot of, listen, there are counselors who will work around how do you actually, there are skills you can develop and there are tools you can use about procrastination. Procrastination will be, um, if any of you suffer from anxiety, if you're also procrastinators, that's the worst combo, right? So you do need to understand that that's what you're doing, and you probably need to get help. Um, there are different ways of doing it. To-do lists are great. I have to-do lists. My husband sort of, he said the other day, he said, I actually have a to-do list. This is terrible, you know. But to-do lists may be a way of breaking things into small chunks. The worst thing is having this thing that you have to do, and you don't even know where to start, so you need to break it down. But there are actually skilled people who can help you. If, if procrastination really is a problem, so for some people it's just... Uh, you're kind of delaying it. But for some people, it actually is a significant problem. You need to recognize it. It's fine. Recognize it and get some help about how to tackle it. I agree with all of that, so I won't repeat it. I'm also <laughs> a morning person. Uh, but I will say that I think this question of, around procrastination, th th for me, the huge... I'm not a procrastinator at all. And actually, I used to drive my roommates in university and then in, in graduate school crazy because I, I just don't procrastinate. I sort of... I used to... When I was doing my PhD, I was actually really lucky in a way. I did it at Cambridge, and the library was open from 9 to 5. And so I said to myself, Monday to Friday. 
So I said to myself, okay, I've got a job, nine to five, Monday to Friday, and then the rest of the time is my personal time. Back to you, I had a great time. <laughs> so going to movies, going to London for theater, etc. but I was at the library at 9 a.m. and I was there at 5 a.m., uh, 5 p.m. every single day and I just stuck with it. But I had a roommate who was a tremendous procrastinator, wonderful person, terribly talented, and your point around breaking things into segments is for me it, crucial. I think if you just see it as an undifferentiated mass of unaccomplished objectives, it's disastrous. So I, I always, when I was studying for something, I always used to do a, a little schedule for myself and I would say, you know, for the next two hours I'm studying this course and then of course after I'm, I'm studying this. And I'd try to break up the day and I would say to myself, <laughs> when am I most tired? Then I'll go to the gym or whatever. So I think you just you have to know yourself and not fight it all the time. And so there's nothing, if you are a procrastinator, that's just who you are. You just have to find the strategies uh, that can break, break out of seeing that as, as a kind of moral failing. It's not a moral failing. It's who you are, and you have to find the strategies to address it. Well, I have to say that I'm a, I get up very early in the morning. So we're all morning people. <laughs> just just for the record, I'm not a morning person. I force myself to wake up. Every night yeah, when we go to bed, my wife says to me, make sure you don't wake me up tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock. Yeah. Um, so um, I get up usually about 5.30 in the morning. And, and um, I'd say, you know, and so, and, and, um, and I really enjoy having time to myself, which is like why I get up early before anybody else is awake before, you know. <laughs> The email flood starts coming from Eastern Canada. I like to have half an hour, an hour, where nothing else is going to bother me. But I just want to talk a little about procrastination because you have to know why you're procrastinating. There are times I purposely procrastinate because I want to really think through something. And it's important for me, and that's who I am, to have time to think about things that are important to me. But then and I would say that's not procrastinating yeah, because you're thinking. Well, <laughs> sometimes people say to me, and it actually happens in my office, my COO was exactly the opposite. She has these lists, she has these long to-do lists, and she just goes through them. And she says, Arnold, why are you procrastinating on this? Let's make a decision to move on. And I, sometimes I'm not sure why I'm not procrastinating, why I'm not making a decision, but it's because it doesn't feel right to me at that point to make a decision. It just doesn't feel like the right thing to do, so I will delay it. And I'd rather make the decision tomorrow or the day after because it's not the right thing to do. So it's important to know why you behave the way you behave, right? Some people love to-do lists. I actually don't because they force me to do things that I'm not ready to do. I, I think about the three or four things I have to get accomplished today, and that's my mental to-do list, and I'm going through those. And sometimes one of those will slip because I don't want to do it for some reason that I may not be able to recognize right away. And sometimes I was wrong. I should have made the decision because it would have been much better. That's just life, you know, you make mistakes. But yeah, I mean, it's important to know why you're not making those decisions. And I think that understanding that about yourself, what is causing you not to go ahead on certain things, will help you on this procrastination issue. Can I just make a comment that one of our previous um, leaders in this series was Sir Al Ainsley Green, who was the first ch children's commissioner in, um, in the UK. A great person, but he, his, he stated that he felt, in his view, and, and for most people's, the main rate-limiting step of what you can accomplish as a leader is your time management. Mm -hmm. If you can't manage your time, then you won't be able to make a difference. So it's really, really important. It's important. <laughs> Not to put any pressure, but... <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> uh, we'll start with Natalie. Uh, hi. I have a question that might be slightly off track, but I think draws on some of what we've discussed. If you're thinking about um, uh, having an obligation to the rest of the world to make the world a better place, something that has struck me and my own experiences and friends of mine is that you really have a duty to look after yourself first and foremost, I think, in order to be able to achieve these grand goals. And I've seen um, people in my age group and a little bit older um, having career shifts and moving, say, uh, from a situation where their own situation demanded that they take a job that perhaps wasn't what they wanted and didn't address their more altruistic needs, but which 10 years down the track gave them the skills, the uh, financial stability to be able to embark upon that. My best friend was a banking lawyer for 10 years uh, because she grew up in a very, very poor family, but now she's um, working on huge projects 
that she's partially funding herself because she has the means and she has the banking skills. And so I sort of see that model and I think I think one of the struggles people face is that they want to go and do all these good things, but they can't necessarily do that in the here and now, or that they need to try and recognise how they could get there eventually um, and create those building blocks. Sorry, I, I did have a question out of this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, sort of, it's an observation, it's a question, but I always feel that though throwing yourself into something with these grand goals, if you don't actually have the skills already, is a bit of a waste, and it can be um, a step back because mm. you've almost failed because you didn't realise um, I needed A, B, and C before I got to D, but now I've tried to get to D now with all this sort of I've got the energy for it, or I think, but I'm not necessarily equipped. Um, so maybe that's where more career planning is necessary, or. Yeah, I haven't really asked a question, but well, I uh, you have. I, I, well, you've made, I think, a, a really important observation, whether it's a question or not. I, I have a, a story about that. Uh, so, when, so when I was an undergraduate, it, it's, it's really repulsive. All, all of my roommates became law students. So there were five of us, and we all <laughs> went to law school. Uh, I went to McGill, one went to Harvard, one went to Stanford, one went to Chicago, one went to Yale. So the other four were all American, I was Canadian. The other four all were in exactly the position that you described. They all wanted to do things that they imagined themselves having uh, a passion to do, but they didn't have a lot of money and they didn't necessarily feel they had the skill sets to do what they really wanted to do. So each and every one of them ended up working for a period of time, gaining skills and some resources, and then they all switched careers, every single one of them. And they're all now doing, actually as of about 15 years ago, doing exactly what they wanted to do, but it took them about 15, 10 to 15 years to get there. So I actually think it's interesting to imagine some parts of your life as being preparatory. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and as long as you can find yourself in a position where you're not unhappy, grossly unhappy doing what you're doing, but you're gaining skill, knowledge, and potentially resources that give you more freedom, I actually think that's a, potentially a great strategy, especially if you found yourself to be in a debt-ridden position, which those people were uh, because of the cost of American law schools. <laughs> uh, also, I would just add that this notion that you may not be ready to do the great big thing that you want to do is part of the humility piece. And it is really important for us to understand when we have the capacity to make those differences. It doesn't mean you can't be doing things along the way. I always think of it, I, I used to uh, talk to first year law students a lot, and they would come in and immediately they wanted to be reforming the, the legal system, right? And, 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 their, and their impulse was right, it was great. But they didn't know anything about it. They didn't know how to do it and what could work and what might not work. So you do have to give yourself time, pre preparation, and the ability to develop the confidence and success in what you've done so that you can make a difference. Sorry, just to, just to follow up just slightly, um, when we talk about making a difference for good, we don't mean making a big difference for good. No. You know, I think no. all the way, as you said, all the way along, you can make a difference every single day. And I, I, it's important not to lose sight of that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, gosh. Okay. Hi. My name is yes. Selena Kutcher, and I'm a PhD student in theater studies. Uh -huh. And some of the earlier comments that many of you made about your leadership being um, having a, a generational influence and thinking, that the changes made now will have an effect on generations in the future. Uh, my focus is on Indigenous studies and Indigenous performance, and I, I'm really curious to understand UBC's leadership in the area of Indigenous studies, because I, uh, I was very fortunate to be able to go to a conference in London. It was an international conference, there were 80 participants, uh, and nine participants were from UBC, which was quite amazing and actually had quite an influence on the conference and made me reflect on my experiences here. I was, I've been so privileged to take courses in the First Nations Studies Department, to study with um, the Musqueam Indian Men and First Nations Languages, and I feel like I've been the recipient of some pretty incredible decisions made 
perhaps generations ago, and I'd just love to know about anything any of you know about those decisions and how this has come to be at UBC. I think, Stephen, you can speak to that. Uh, well, um, of, in large part because of our president. No, I, I mean, it goes back. It's, it's, I hope it's partly because of where we are. Uh, you know, our, our uh, strategic plan is called Place and Promise, and it's not by accident. Place is really important in, in understanding, I think, who we are. And we are on Musqueam territory, and we are on the west coast of North America, where happily, uh, indigenous peoples were not exterminated as they were in much of North America and where there has been a vital tradition. Now it was you know, degraded and torn apart with residential schools, etc. But there was a strength in those communities that's allowed blossoming to take place and I think the university has been part of that. I think for a long time the heart of it was the Museum of Anthropology. So we're not going, sadly, we're not going back that far, we're going into the 70s, but there was visionary leadership in the museum to reach out to communities and to try to develop collaborative artistic relationships and, and, and learning relationships rather than um, projecting relationships of, of the university telling people how they could be better. Uh, and then I think we've had successive generations of people who were in lots of different parts of the university, and I think that's really the key for UBC success. You had the NITEP program in education, you had First Nations House of Learning, you had uh, strength at some parts of medicine, you had strength in the law faculty. The problem from my perspective was that it was all quite fractionated, and I'll stop by saying when uh, we started to think about reflecting on the future of UBC and creating the, the plan that is now Place and Promise, consciously we started by uh, asking Aboriginal communities and people who worked with Aboriginal communities how they would imagine the future relationship of the university. That was the starting place for the strategic planning process. And actually, it helped us learn a lot about really respectful, listening, uh, and it also helped us, I think, imagine how communities can work together effectively. So it then had an impact on the whole strategic plan. Uh, but I would say, you know, to give due credit that there were lots of people over many generations who in their own perhaps small ways and certainly within limited fields worked to develop those relationships. And now I think we're benefiting from an ability to draw that together. But if I can add, and and I will give you credit, Stephen. It was senior leadership at the university that went from that place to really saying, we are going to be investing in this. We have now a strategic plan around Aboriginal issues. Um, and people report you know, religiously on it. This is not something that just happened and was shelved. Um, we have accountability around how do we actually know that we're me meeting the targets that we've set. We've got very active recruitment of Aboriginal students across, including in the health professional programs, um, and active recruitment of Aboriginal faculty and support for them as well. So I think that you need to you need to have this is where senior leadership was able to build on what we had, bring it together, and make a concerted commitment that was not just a commit a one time a commitment that has been lasting that now is part of the fabric of this university. And it is very different from other universities, certainly where I've been. Very, very different. Interestingly, I'll add a very technical point on this. And it, again, this shows, I think, how leadership can also be about making very precise decisions that can have a long impact. So one decision that we made, as, because we started the strategic planning process with Aboriginal engagement, we actually said, we're going to draw all of those decisions into the core budget of the university. It had been previously that all of these various projects had largely been on soft money. They had been uh, on the side of a lot of people's desks. And then we said, no, 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 if we're going to commit to this, then we have to take it off the top of the budget right at the beginning and not see what's left over when we've done everything else. And that was, I think, quite important. I just want to take 60 seconds. I know there are a lot of other questions, but one, one, you know, it's, it's encouraging and discouraging your experience uh, at this conference that nine of the whatever number of people were, were from this university. It's great that we have this leadership role, but it's sad that that 
that there are others. Um, and it, this is not to take away from anything that this university has accomplished, because it really is truly, it's one of the reasons I, I, I'm here and one of the reasons I want to be here. But the bar was pretty damn low. It was low. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> and, pretty it's, damn low. And sadly remains low. And, uh, you know, yeah. I think that because of that, we, all of us, you know, even those of those of us, and probably most of you in here, aren't necessarily studying areas around Aboriginal. But I mean, I think we have a responsibility to kind of be ambassadors and show what's been what's been successful, what's worked, um, you know. And and wherever you know, all of you end up, um, hopefully, kind of bring that spirit to other universities because that's really the only way this is going to spread. And this is you know, this is not an issue in Canada, in the U.S. This is an issue all over the world. Aboriginal issues are are you know endemic, unfortunately. And so few places are really addressing it well all over the world. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, in academia right now, I would say the current reward system often promotes uh, competition over top of collaboration. <laughs> and most of that, I would say, is due to a single success metric being your publication record and citation record. If you could make a single change to either the success metric or to the reward system that would promote collaboration, what would it be? <laughs> well, I'm thinking of the single metric. That's what's sort of stumping me. Um, the unit that I lead is uh, it's College of Health Disciplines, which is about interprofessional education in the health professions and, and collaborative practice. Um, and what has been you know, to give you a, a, a little anecdote of what you've just described, we, I had one of the directors of one of the programs come to me and say, you know, this faculty member is going forward for promotion and tenure, and the work that he or she is doing with your college, trying to advance into professional education, et cetera, is actually detracting from the promotion dossier. So there's a problem here, to which I really felt pretty saddened, not to mention kind of angry, <laughs> but saddened because I thought this was not his issue, it was the system's issue. So you're absolutely right. And one of, again, one of our themes in Place and Promise is interdisciplinarity. And I've said over and over again that if we continue to reward, you're the PI, you brought in the grant, you have this, et cetera, we're never going to be able to really move into an interdisciplinary world. So that's just restating what you've said, but in spades. Um, I think we need to look at, the, you know, the, there's, there are things we can do within our university, and, and those could be to look at some of our promotion issues, and to really be able to say, how would we, what evidence would be allow us to know <coughs> that that person actually is collaborating in a way that's meaningful? And I think that's part of the difficulty, is we don't really know what that evidence would look like. But we need to figure it out. We've been able to do it around teaching. And so we probably need to, to figure it out around, um, uh, around that collaboration piece. But there are also issues at the system level when the funding agencies say you need one PI, right? You can't have a whole bunch of, you can have co or whatever, but you still need to be the designated. So I think we need to work at different levels. But I do think if we could crack that evidence um, piece and be able to come up with very meaningful evidence we all agree on, it would make it a lot easier for people to even put their dossiers together, which right now is a challenge. So, so the very question, what one metric, as soon as you have a metric, <laughs> exactly, there will be competition for who is the highest on that metric, right? The metric is, is a sense of measure. So, I mean, one has to be careful about redefining the metrics because it just changes behavior to be the best at something else. So I can be the best at collaboration. If you can measure how much I collaborate, I will be the best at it. Because I will collaborate with everyone. Um, but, but I think there's a, there is a fundamental challenge here because this is not a UBC issue. The system as a whole and academia has certain ways we measure. Okay? And for me, I'm not sure my standing at UBC is perceived as important as my standing in the international community. There's very few people at UBC who do what I do from a research point of view. It's is colleagues around the world, and we're all being measured in some sense in the same way. So the system is inherently set up to compete with each other. Some competition is actually good. We want to produce the best results and so on. I, I think the real challenge for me is this idea that we've gotten to, to using these very simplistic metrics. How many papers did I write in what's considered you know, the top journals? How many grants did I bring in? And so on. That, to me, is the real problem. It's not the body of work 
that I've produced, if I asked fundamental questions and really spent a long time thinking about them. In fact, I almost feel the system is moving away from me spending years thinking about a fundamental question to a system that gets the smallest quantifiable units because there's so much pressure to publish all the time. And, and I see it with my students. I mean, my students want to publish. Right? They are really scared they're not going to get an academic job unless they publish. And it's almost I feel I'm holding them back. I'm saying, you know what? Let's round this out. Let's, do, let's ask all the questions. Let's produce one great paper instead of ten little papers. So I think there's a real issue here. And, and part of this is not just about collaboration versus, versus pub. It's not just a collaboration issue. It's about making sure that we as academics really are true to what we were set out to do, which is ask fundamental questions and go and really explore these issues deeply, and which means that we will collaborate much more because if I'm going to ask something hard, I'm going to have to ask lots of people to work with me. And if we can get to that stage, and, and I have some thoughts about what, how we can measure mm -hmm. that kind of behavior, which doesn't go against international norms. So for example, when someone comes up for tenure, already we do things like, we say, give us your five best papers, and then we'll send those out for international peers to review. But by the way, we also include your CV. And all along the way, when you were coming up for tenure, we were always measuring how much you were producing each year. So maybe what we need to be is consistent throughout the process. That you know we're going to constantly be reflecting back five years. And what was the two or three things you were most proud about in the last five years? Maybe they were your students you're most proud of. Maybe because you collaborated on a, a number of different projects. Maybe as the PI or non-PI, it doesn't really matter. But you added meaningful lead to those projects. So I think we need to think about those in a very fundamental way. And I think actually UBC could take some leadership, at least mm -hmm. in the Canadian system, in trying to reform some of that. Because unfortunately, it is being reflected even in the granting councils now to have these very quick metrics. And I have to say, I've sat on some committees where you're given this box of stuff to read and assess people in a couple of days. And it's really tempting to start counting papers because, boy, anything else would just be too much work. I mean, how do you read everything in this and synthesize? So I think we, we have to start having some of those conversations. But don't be surprised if it doesn't happen in the short term. <laughs> I'm in the privileged position of reading every single tenure and promotion file. And I actually have to make the final decision on each and every one of those files. And uh, so I'm in a very uh, unusual uh, position on this. And, and so my optic is, is clearly uh, perhaps uh, in some senses perverse. I actually, I actually think the problem here, and I'm going to be, I'll say something really dramatic, is at the departmental level. That's where we have to address this issue. Because I don't measure the number of papers that someone produces. When it gets to me, I, can, I promise you, I do not count. I couldn't care less, actually, about how much money someone brings in. And that's a big problem in medical files. I'm now telling you all sorts of stories I shouldn't. Because so often, the medical files come up and they say, oh, someone brought in $138 million in grant money over the last 10 years. I want to know, so what? What happened? Right. What, what did it do? The fact that they're good grantsmen, or women, that's usually men, uh, <laughs> uh, is, is OK. You know, it, it, if, it's, if it's part of a story that says consistently this person has shown that their work has benefit and is influential, et cetera. But I actually think that the key is that kind of it, it, the key is not to develop two or three different metrics. The key is to look at the whole picture and ask yourself, what was this person's human circumstance? Sometimes their wife died, or their kid's been sick, or they had a baby. OK, you, you have to understand <coughs> that. You have to say, OK, well, that's relevant in this process. What was the mentoring like for this person? Sometimes it's crappy. And you look and you say, oh my heavens, how did this person teach eight new courses in four years? How did that happen? How is it that they were the chair of the curriculum committee in their second or third year? You have to ask those questions. You have to say, OK, well, where have they published? What have they published? You know, what's the influence of that? So you're looking at you know, all those crazy metrics around impact scores, and, which are only relevant in some disciplines and not in others. Uh, you have to look at what their teaching obligations were. You have to look at what graduate students they mentored to successful completion. Did they all drop out during the program? Well, what does that tell you about their mentoring abilities? So 
you and you have to look at are they doing community based research which takes longer to try to generate results from if they've been working with an Aboriginal community for seven years and they're only now getting to pull all the results together, well, that's relevant in, in you, how you evaluate the file. So I actually think if you've got rational people looking at the files and not falling back on arbitrary metrics, then you can actually have a sensible process. The hard piece, though, and it is true, is knowing how to evaluate the more complex and subtle elements of community-based research or of um, collaboration and, and figuring out, is this person really contributing successfully? Well, you've got to ask some hard questions there, and, and it may require different kinds of letters of reference, et cetera. And, and I love the idea of, of asking the person to reflect on what he or she thought their biggest contributions were. Last piece I'll say, I'm sorry I'm going on so long, but I, I think often it's really bad mentoring at the departmental level that screws these files up because people say, I've, I've heard people say, well, I got advice from a senior professor that the only thing that mattered is what is my uh, you know, publication record. We've struggled, for example, to push uh, the teaching profile over the last seven or eight years uh, so that that counts. And I think we've made huge progress there at UBC, but now is the time to, to try to make this more comprehensive analysis um, uh, come forward and to really start encouraging, again, our, our scholars, our evaluators, not to be just replicating their own experience because it was bad. It was a bad experience in the tenure and review process. Why do we want to replicate that? And I, I think we've got to try to work as hard as we can to break the pattern. But this is not just a UBC issue. It is a really, really system-wide issue. Well, I wish we had several more hours, but I do appreciate uh, that you need to balance your life. <laughs> um, so I think we'll... I'm going out to supper with a donor, so... <laughs> we'll have to wrap up, unfortunately, but um, maybe just a, just a very quick um, last word from you folks about any advice for these folks. Do you have any, any last words? Well, I do. Um, because no one is really, we've, we've skirted around the issue of balance, personal life, professional life, et cetera. But my experience, again, in a leader, and particularly for young women, but I think this applies equally to young men, is the worry that if you embark in leadership roles, your academic career, your professional career gets, that there won't be any place for your personal life. And that something's got to give, right? I can't do both. I hear people say this all the time. I don't want to sacrifice one thing to do this. And so I'll tell you what I did. Again, I sort of fell into these positions. But I'm a mother and a wife. I have three children. And from the get-go, I made it very clear in my own mind, and I wasn't afraid to say it. I'm sorry, I can't do that because I have an obligation at home kid has a recital or a, or a basketball game, and I actually, I have to go to that. And I said it. I wasn't afraid. Most people will sort of run out, and hopefully nobody's going to notice that you've gone. So it was clear in my mind that my children were my priority, and I wasn't afraid to say it. And I'm still sitting here. So my advice is don't, don't, you don't have to compromise. You just have to be clear what your priority is, and, and you have to be reasonable about it, but you, if it's clear in your head and you're not afraid to say it, you'll feel a lot better and you won't feel conflicted. So sorry, that was a little longer than that. Can I add on that? I, I, because I completely agree, and despite the fact that I said I didn't do it enough, <laughs> um, I actually think both men and women have to challenge on, on these issues. And there are certain things that happen, there are structural things. I'll give you a very concrete example. Uh, when I was at McGill, it used to be that the faculty council meeting was always scheduled from 4 to 6 on a Thursday afternoon. And a bunch of us younger professors got together and we went to the dean and we said, men and women, mm -hmm. and that was, I think, helpful, and we said, you know, that's a really lousy time for us to have a faculty council mm -hmm. meeting because it means we can't, if we have to be there or want to be there to 
play our governance role, then we're somehow not going to be able to go home and be with our children at 5.30 or whenever we would normally do that. Can we change the time? In the schedule, there are periods scheduled uh, where we're supposed to be able to have meetings. Let's do it uh, 12 to 2 on a, on a Wednesday or whatever. And, and I think it... It's okay to do that, I think. Yeah, you might run into some Neanderthals who push back, but I suspect that over time, if we keep pressing on these, on these issues, it becomes easier for all of us to challenge. Yeah. Actually, I was gonna say that, that you shouldn't be scared to challenge the system. I mean, the system overall was just constructed by the previous generation. It wasn't some grand thought out <laughs> plan that was really micromanaged to the nth degree. It was just a system, you know. It, you know, this is a really good example, and and, and I see this all the time. And my tax now is seventy percent young women, and they constantly challenge me. Why did we do it this way? And now, well, because that's my reality. But you know, we can change it because you'd be surprised how often, if you just challenge the system a little bit, it will change. And so, don't sit back and think, well, you know what? This is a senior professor who wants to do it this way. Ask why, you know, why can't we do it this way? If you make a cogent argument, you don't want to be shrill about it, you just want a cogent, reasonable argument. If we do it this way, this, this, this will be the effect, this will why it'll be better. Yeah, sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't, but just asking those questions is really important. And let me just say, this is the whole point of being a graduate student. Graduate studies is all about asking the questions that other people haven't asked. So that's what we're hopefully training you to do, but it goes beyond your particular research program. It goes into the way you live your life. It goes into the interactions you have with other people. Just ask the questions. And, and, and I think the impact of asking the questions will be far more than often you realize. Um, gosh, I, I, I did everything these guys said. I mean, really, is uh, finding balance, I think, is crucial. And so few people do it. And that doesn't, you know, if you don't want to have a family and you just want to go skiing, find your balance that way. If you want to play music, find your balance that way. The most successful people have that balance. The people, and I'm sure you've all had the experience, the people who are like singularly focused and their entire life is nothing but that, usually aren't that successful. You know, they're, they're, it's hard to succeed when, when, you're, when you're that, when, you're, when you don't have that balance. Um, but challenging the system, I mean, challenging, you know, as I said, I, uh, Tell the, that department head who, who says you shouldn't write that op-ed to go f off because you need to you need to feel empowered to do that. I think that we our generation didn't do that enough. I think that when I was coming up, I remember slinking out through literally through the fire exit once when I had to get my son was in the hospital and and I you know I knew that the boss would still get mad so I like snuck out through the fire exit. I think back on. <laughs> I was thinking about that when you were talking about that, but um, you know, there's a lot of hand wringing uh, about millennials, millennials, and you know, all the problems with millennials. And I, you know, when I I, I have a company here, and when I first uh, started hiring millennials, and they would like quit on me, I would get so, what's wrong with these this generation? You know, I sound like an old person. But now I, you know, I, I, they didn't like the hours. They didn't like. I mean, that's. What what they didn't do is they didn't convict, they didn't communicate, and I think that's an important part. Um, communicate what's wrong. Don't just quit or don't just you know throw your hands up, but communicate what's wrong. You know this this tenure system sucks, or this publication quantification system. I don't agree with it. Whatever it is, communicate that. Um, you know this university doesn't acknowledge that that wherever you are that you know that that uh, there are Aboriginal people in this area. Why don't, why, why does our university do that? Um, whatever the issue is that, that you um, might might uh, feel strongly about, you know, don't don't be afraid because I think most people will respect you for that. Well, thank you all very much. This has been a tremendous two hours. I've I've learned so much myself, and I hope you guys have enjoyed it as well. So. Please